the Deputy Leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, John Dillon MP, once said, quote, Women's suffrage will, I believe, be the ruin of our Western civilization. It will destroy the home, challenging the headship of man laid down by God. It may come true in your time, I hope not in mine. Unquote. Welcome to Deeds Not Words, No Surrender. After an almost three hour sailing across the calm Irish Sea from Holyhead, the RMS Leinster docked at the quayside in Kingston Harbour, now known as Dunleary Harbour. It was Tuesday, July 16th, 1912. As the passengers disembarked, two Englishwomen mingled with a throng as they arrived in Ireland for the very first time. This is the furthest either of them had ever travelled. With their small leather overnight cases, they made their way to the nearby railway terminus and took the steam train into Western Row Station and Dublin city centre. The two women who arrived in Kingstown Harbour that morning were in the top left London-born Gladys Evans, the daughter of a wealthy stockbroker. She had for a time worked at Selfridge's department store before briefly emigrating to Canada in 1911, only to return to England a year later. To the right of her is Birmingham-born Lizzie Baker, although Baker was a nom de guerre, for this was Miss Jenny Baines. Baines had begun her working life aged just 11 at an explosives factory. At just 4 feet 9 she may have been small in stature, but her desire to change the world she lived in was much bigger. She was a member of the Salvation Army, the Temperance Movement, the Labour Party, and later the Suffragette Movement. When they arrived, they purchased a Dublin newspaper, and as they travelled into the city, they perused the accommodation available section, and they settled on this one. It said, Dublin Private Boarding House. Visitors will find first-class accommodation at St. Margaret's House, 15 Lower Mount Street. Electric light, terms moderate, Apply manageress. They arrived at 6.30 p.m. at 15 Lower Mount Street, the lodging house of Jesse Cameron, but it was managed by Mary Kelly. She provided them with a room at a half a crown per night, including breakfast. A room on the first floor was big enough to accommodate four guests, as Gladys explained that two more ladies would be joining them shortly. The city into which Evans and Baker arrived was filled with excitement and the newspapers filled their pages with coverage of the forthcoming visit of Prime Minister Henry Asquith to Dublin, the first ever visit of a British Prime Minister to the city. The streets were bedecked with bunting and flags in anticipation of the visit, which was beginning the following Thursday. The newspapers gave detailed descriptions of the planned itinerary, the routes, the vantage points, and most importantly, the security. Asquith was arriving at the second city of the empire as a hero. He had secured, with the support of John Redmond's Irish Parliamentary Party, passage to the House of Commons of the Third Home Rule Bill. Unlike the two previous attempts that had failed when voted down by the House of Lords, that path to veto had been removed from the Lords, and while they could delay its implementation, they could not stop it. Home Rule would devolve power from Westminster to a new Parliament in Dublin a course of action that would not please the Unionists, especially in the northern part of the island. When passage through the House of Commons was confirmed, tens of thousands turned out onto the streets of Dublin to celebrate, and Asquith was the hero. His arrival was not without controversy. Security was tightened across the city, and extra policemen were put onto the streets to protect the visiting dignitaries. The threats were threefold. Ulster Unionists unhappy with the Home Rule Bill, Irish Nationalists who wanted complete independence from Britain and following in the footsteps of the Young Islanders and Fenians, and the biggest domestic threat at the time to the British Prime Minister in 1912 was the Suffragettes. Asquith's route to Holyhead had been kept a secret and rather than a direct route from London to Holyhead, the party took the train to Wolverhampton and then by road through Wales to the Welsh port. But his itinerary in Dublin was not so secret. Surely suffragettes would not be an issue here. 
That, however, was quickly dispelled, as a couple of Irish suffragettes sailed out in a small boat to greet the RMS Leinster as it passed through the harbour entrance, and used a bullhorn to shout slogans at the British Prime Minister. The photograph on the left-hand side is a photograph that shows Asquith receiving presentations from young lads in Kingstown on his arrival. The Prime Minister's party included his wife, two daughters, a son and a large group of officials eager to be part of this celebration. Asquith arrived just after 8pm on Thursday night. He was officially welcomed to Ireland by John Redmond, leader of the Irish Parliamentary Party, whose roots were in the movement of Charles Stuart Parnell. He was assisted by his fellow nationalists, John Dillon and Joseph Devlin, an MP from Belfast. Also in the greeting party was the Lord Mayor of Dublin, Lorcan Sherlock, representatives of local councils and corporations, and of course the local clergy. The cheers were described as deafening as Asquith waved to the thousands, eager to get a glimpse of him. Some hours earlier, on an earlier sailing across the Irish Sea, two more women arrived with determination and radical plans. Manchester-born Mary Lee, a former school teacher born Mary Brown, who had to give up her profession when she got married. And also Manchester-born Mabel Capper, the youngest of the four ladies at just 23 years old. All four, Evans, Baines, Lee and Capper, were, by July 1912, militant suffragettes. The Women's Social Political Union was founded by Emmeline Pankhurst and engaged in a militant campaign to gain women the right to vote. They had gathered in large protests, especially in London. They harassed politicians at speaking events, including those of men like Asquith, Lloyd George and Winston Churchill. There were riots on the streets. They stoned windows, including those of 10 Downing Street, the home of the British Prime Minister. And they began a letter bomb campaign that targeted post boxes. All four women were battled hardened campaigners, and all four had already spent time at, her ma at His Majesty's pleasure in prison. They were domestic terrorists. Lee and Capper, having arrived in Dublin, made their way to Mount Street to reunite with Evans and Baines. The train carrying Asquith's party arrived at Wrestling Row Station and another greeting party made up of Irish mayors and Lord Mayors were introduced to the British Prime Minister. Then Asquith, his wife Margot Asquith, John Redmond and Lord Mayor Sherlock entered an open horse-drawn carriage that would go in procession to the Gresham Hotel on Sackville Street, now O'Connell Street, where the visitors would be staying for the night. The procession was led by 20 bands and 2,000 torchbearers, lighting up the darkness of the night. Security was in the hands of the Dublin Metropolitan Police, or DMP, and the Irish National Foresters. The foresters were easily identifiable, as they dressed in Robert Emmett-style costumes of bright emerald green. Walking alongside the carriage was Chief Ranger, as the group's leader was titled, John O'Brien, who acted as marshal. The route would take them up Clare Street onto Nassau Street, passing the old Irish Parliament building on College Green and Trinity College, over O'Connell Bridge and down the street to the Gresham Hotel. The DMP believed that they had contained the suffrage issue in Ireland. A month earlier, on June 13th, an Irish branch of the suffrage movement engaged in stone throwing attacks on the GPO the Custom House and Dublin Castle. Eight women, including their leader, Hannah Sheehy Skeffington, were arrested and imprisoned. They were in Tullamore Prison when Ascot arrived in Dublin. There had been some hope that the right to vote for women would be enshrined in the new Home Rule Bill, but the women were left disappointed and frustrated when it was not. There was no love lost between the British Prime Minister and the demand for women's voting rights. He once said of women, Women have no reason, very little humour, hardly no sense of honour, and no sense of proportion. Just as Asquith's special train was arriving in the city centre, the four women left their lodgings on Mount Street and walked to the Theatre Royal on Hawkins Street. 
The theatre the following day was to be the venue of a gathering of Home Rule supporters, which would be addressed by Asquith, his keynote speech of the trip. When the women arrived there, just after 8.30pm, it was between shows. They purchased their tickets and went in. But they never had any intention of enjoying any entertainment on offer. With just the orchestra rehearsing between shows in the pits and less than half a dozen people in the theatre, the suffragette attack begun. Evans, in a stall above the stage to the right, set fire to a chair and lobbed it into the orchestra pit, scattering the musicians under the leadership there of John Moody. A second incendiary was thrown onto the stage, which set fire to the curtains. This was quickly doused by the stagehands. Meanwhile, at the back of the theatre, a canister of white powder was dropped into the projectionist's booth, but it failed to ignite. This was described later as gunpowder. Pandemonium ensued. Evans made her escape, but she was grabbed by an off-duty soldier, Sergeant Derham Cooper of the Connacht Rangers, who then turned her over to DMP Constable William Taylor, who had arrived from the nearby station at Brunswick Street, just yards away. Brunswick Street Station is now Pier Street Garda Station. In the confusion, the other three escaped. Capper and Baines made their way back to Mount Street. Splitting up as hoping to be the best chance of escape, Lee, whose presence at the theatre would later to be confirmed by the theatre barmaid Mary Morrissey, went out onto the Liffey Keys and the short distance to a packed O'Connell Bridge. The crowds were in a frenzy as the sound of the bands grew closer. The Prime Minister could not be far behind. The cavalcade was to make its way down O'Connell Street, past Nelson's Column, and arrived at the Gresham Hotel, pictured here on the right with the cream front. The 2,000 torchbearers in the night in front of the Prime Minister signalled his arrival. The crowds cheered and pushed closer to get a glimpse. The marshal struggled to maintain a path through the crowd. Asquith's progress was slowed, at times almost to a stop. This is a photograph of uh, the Prime Ministerial carriage carrying the British Prime Minister, Henry Asquith, his wife, Lady Asquith, Redmond and Sherlock, as it made its way towards O'Connell Bridge. You could see the Prime Minister's wife standing up, waving at the crowds, responding to their adulation. Celebration was in the air. Seated is Redmond, and there are two coachmen uh, who are driving the horses through the congested streets. The Irish Independent used illustrations and drawings to convey the sense of scale, ceremony and excitement on O'Connell Street. As the carriage continued its slow progress through the crowds, Mary Lee pushed through, jostling with onlookers, determined to get closer. The most radical and dangerous attack was about to happen. Lee edged closer, pushing and weaving her way through the densely packed main street. As the carriage reached the entrance of Princess Street, with the GPO on the right, Lee made her play. From inside her coat, she retrieved and threw a hatchet at the British Prime Minister. It missed its intended target, but hit John Redmond on the ear. When he eventually arrived at the hotel, Dr John McArdle stemmed the bleeding. John O'Brien, the Chief Marshal, saw the attack and grabbed Lee at the rear of the carriage, but in the struggle she divested herself of her coat in order to escape his clutches. Still not free, she hit him in the face with, quote, as much force as I could muster, unquote, leaving him bruised and sporting a black eye. The hatchet landed on the floor of the carriage between the legs of Asquid and his wife. Attached to the handle of the axe was a note saying, this symbol of the extinction of the Liberal Party forevermore. Lee merged and disappeared into the crowd, now in a heightened frenzy after an apparent assassination attempt on the British Prime Minister in their city. Lee made her way, hurriedly, back to Mount Street. The Prime Ministerial carriage continued on its journey to the Gresham. Redmond was treated in the lobby for his wound, and to ease the tension now felt on the streets, Asquith went out onto the balcony of the hotel and addressed those outside.
The following day, Asquith fulfilled his schedule of engagements, but security was enhanced. Instead of travelling in an open carriage as had been planned, he was now assigned a motor car. He visited the Voiced Regal Lodge in the Phoenix Park, now home to the Irish President, Horace Neutron, and also to an event in Artane. The picture on the lower left here, you can see the motor car of Asquith leaving the Voiced Regal Lodge as he headed for Artane. In order to enhance his safety, on the second night of his visit, the Asquith party stayed in the Voice Regal Lodge with Augustine Burrell and the Lord Lieutenant. That night he addressed the crowd at the Theatre Royal. The smell of smoke still lingered in the air, according to reporters who covered the speech. Even his speech was interrupted by Francis Sheehy Skeffington later to be murdered by the British forces in the Ratmines barracks during the 1916 Easter Rising, and husband of Hannah Shee Skeffington, the leader of the Irish suffragette movement. He shouted at the Prime Minister, who, ex who was extolling the virtues of the Home Rule for Ireland, What about the women of Ireland? He was promptly ejected. This would be a severe learning curve for the security services, and would change how the British Prime Minister travelled, especially when he returned to London. This is a map of the attack. Asquith arrived at Western Row Station, now Pier Street Station, and entered his carriage and made his way up towards Nassau Street, onto College Green and down onto O'Connell Street, heading towards the Gresham Hotel. Meanwhile, at 8.15, the four women left Mount Street and made their way to the Theatre Royal for their attack. Once the attack was over, and Evans had been arrested, Lee made her way onto O'Connell Street and her date with destiny and her hatchet attack on the British Prime Minister and his party. She then hurriedly made her way back to Mount Street, where Capper and Baines were awaiting her. Once Evans was in custody, it was easy to trace the whereabouts of the others. Just before midnight, policemen and detectives arrived at 15 Mount Street and arrested Lee, Baines and Capper. On Friday morning, they appeared at Green Street Court, charged with over a dozen crimes, including arson, attempted murder, explosive possession, and Lee was to be charged with attempting to assassinate the British Prime Minister. The case was to be heard before Justice Hamilton Madden, a Tipperary-born judge of the Irish High Court. He was a former Unionist MP, representing Trinity College, a role he gave up when he was appointed to the Irish Courts. His seat in Trinity College was taken by Edward Carson. The twelve charges were put to the four women, and each of them, in a loud and clear voice, answered, Not guilty. They were to be defended by Tim Healy. Healy was Cork born and a well known and successful barrister, and in 1912 was an MP. He originally represented Parnell's Irish Parliamentary Party, now led by John Redmond. But following his success at a by-election in 1911, he was aligned with the All-Ireland League. He once was an ally of Redmond in the IIP, but found himself on the fringes of the nationalist movement. He would, however, later in 1922, go on to serve as the first Governor-General of the new Irish Free State. This is an Irish independent artist depiction of the four women sitting in court, listening to proceedings. But coverage in British newspapers, especially the Daily Mirror, was different, including using photographs from inside the courtroom to dramatise and sensationalise the events. The British Daily had earned the wrath of the public and the judiciary in England after publishing photographs of a murder trial of Frederick Seddon, including the judge wearing the black cap as he pronounced the death sentence. There was a moratorium on these types of photographs, later to be outlawed in 1925 but that did not cover the Irish courts. As you can see from this photograph, it was unusual to see so many women in the spectators gallery, all supporting the four suffragettes. Along with the women inside the courtroom, hundreds were outside the court cheering the arrival of the women in their prison vans and lending their vocal support throughout the hearing. 
the women's suffrage movement was gathering pace and its cause was maintaining news headlines in both Ireland and Britain. Women will beat Asquins won't is the sign there at the top left. And there on your right hand side, you can see a cartoon which uh, depicts the suffragettes carrying hatchets from 1912 saying smash everything. The trial of the four women began on Tuesday, August 6th, 1912. Capper, who had acted as a lookout and was the youngest of the four, was the only one that had been granted bail in the aftermath of the attack. And as the trial began, she was informed that the charges against her had been dropped and she was released. The charge of attempted murder against Lee was to be tried separately and therefore Evans, Baines and Lee were to be a tri tried for the attack on the Theatre Royal. A jury of 12 men were unable to unanimously, unanimously agree on a verdict. There was a certain sympathy for their cause in the city. The following day, in front of a new jury, they were tried again, and after an absence of just six minutes, they were all found guilty. Throughout the militant campaign on the British mainland, suffragettes who were arrested, including those who broke the windows at 10 Downing Street, received sentences of not more than three months. Dublin was to be different. Jenny Baines was sentenced to seven months hard labour, while Evans and Lee, described as ringmaters and planners, were sentenced to five years penal servitude each. They were being made an example of, with the toughest sentence ever meted out to a suffragette. Not only were mainstream newspapers in both Britain and Ireland covering the case, those particular publications aimed at women both in Britain and Ireland, Votes for Women in Britain and the Irish Citizen in Ireland, both offered their opinions and thoughts on the case, but as it proceeded and ended. The women were taken by prison van from Green Street Courthouse to Mountjoy Jail to begin their sentences. After five weeks, Baines was released. The women demanded that the prison authorities treat them as political prisoners, but the authorities in both Mountjoy and Dublin Castle refused. Lee and Evans then employed a tactic first used by the suffragettes in England. They went on hunger strike. Lee had already conducted a hunger strike in 1909 at Winston Green Prison. The Dublin prison authorities did not want to create martyrs for the cause and followed tactics employed in England. They force fed the women. This was the first time this was to happen in Ireland. It was a barbaric treatment which began on the sixth day of the strike. In charge was Dr David Flynn and a plastic tube was forced down the throat or up the nasal passage with a funnel attached into which a mixture of eggs and milk was poured in. Both women had begun their hunger strike. With the mantra victory or death, Lee described the force feeding treatment at Mount Joy Jail like this, quote, on Saturday afternoon, the wardress forced me onto the bed and two doctors came in. While I was held down, a nasal tube was inserted. It is two yards long with a funnel at the end. There is a glass junction in the middle to see if the liquid is passing. The end is put up the right and left nostril on alternative days. The sensation is most painful. The drums of the ear seem to be bursting and there is a horrible pain in the throat and breast. The tube is pushed down 20 inches. I am on the bed, pinned down by the wardresses. One doctor holds the funnel end and another doctor forces the end up the nostrils. The after effects are the feelings of faintness. A sense of great pain in the diaphragm or breastbone, in the nose and the ears. The tube has to go below the breastbone. These are photograph. This is a photograph taken from a German film made in 1913 called Die Suffragette or The Suffragette, which clearly shows how force feeding was being done. The health of the two women began to deteriorate significantly. There was a vocal campaign in Dublin and London in support of the women. Lee's weight loss was dramatic. She had fought the authorities every time, forcing herself to vomit up the force feed. She was now refusing food for 44 days and weighed just five stone four and a half pounds. 
the prison authorities became concerned that Lee would die in prison, and the decision on medical advice of doctors Christopher Nixon and Thomas Miles was that she should be released into the care of the nearby Matter Hospital. Just after 6pm on September 20th, Lee left through the gates of Mountjoy Jail and was collected by a cab of supporters. At the front end of the Matter Hospital, rather than being admitted, as was with the agreement with the prison governor, she was taken to the home of Dr Kathleen Maguire on Merrion Square, who cared for the seriously ill rights activist. Because Evans had initially been more cooperative with the force feeding, her weight loss was less extreme and was detained even after Lee's release. However, once Lee had left Mountjoy, Evans felt it necessary to speed up her own release to resist more forcefully to the torture of feeding. The London Times reported this change in behaviour on Monday, September 30th. It said, from the time her companion left, she made a desperate resistance to forcible feeding. On Monday before her release, she barricaded her cell door, which was burst open. On Tuesday, she managed to block the bathroom door, took refuge in a fully filled bath, fully clad. This she did to cause delay and put off the moment of torture. On Wednesday, she fought and struggled so that they were unable to feed her at all. Eventually, by October, on October 2nd, Augustine Burrell, the Chief Secretary of Ireland, in consultation with the prison authorities and the Lord Lieutenant, decided that Evans should be released. Once Evans was released, she was put into the care of Dr Kathleen Maguire, who was also looking after Lee, who was recuperating from her hunger strike. The Irish Times headline was, Victory for the Hunger Strikers. Because of a heavy police presence impeding the work of the doctor, Evans was moved to Raglan Road and the home of Mrs Earl. The houses were being watched night and day by the authorities, with policemen stationed on roofs in doorways and alleyways nearby. Evans was re-arrested on a charge of not notifying her place of residence to the police. When she was removed to prison again, she went back on hunger strike but she was discharged by the courts on November 8th. The charge relating to the throwing of the hatchet and a case of malicious wounding against by Lee against Redmond was postponed on a number of occasions as she was too ill to attend court. The case would eventually be heard on December 11th in front of Justice Madden and a jury of 12 men. Lee intelligently and articulately defended herself. Those on the prosecution side were not the most virtuous men that they would have liked to have been portrayed in, as in, in the media. Dr McArdle, who had treated Redman for his injury after Lee's attack, had just a couple of years earlier, in 1909, been at the centre of a scandalous divorce case that fascinated the public and horrified the Archbishop of Dublin. John Shentstone Bishop sought a divorce in London from his wife Ethel as divorce at the time was not recognised in Dublin. He claimed she was having an adulterous affair with her next-door neighbour at Merrion Square, Dr McArdle. It would be considered tabloid sensationalism of the day. The divorce was granted after tales of lust, secret rendezvous at race meetings, illicit card games and a spying servant girl on behalf of her master, Bishop. Seymour Bush, who prosecuted the case, had his own skeletons in the closet. In 1886, he married Kathleen Maud after she was divorced from her first husband, Gerald Brooke, for an open and criminal adulterous affair. Brooke died just three years later, aged just 38. It believed It is believed the scandal surrounding this and his portrayal in Ulysses by James Joyce kept him from ever being appointed as a judge. Lee was passionate in her defence of both her actions and the suffragette movement. At one point, she cross-examined Sergeant Shea, a witness from the Theatre Royal. She asked in relation to the white powder thrown into the projectionist booth, You have no doubt it was gunpowder, not snuff? I am certain it was not snuff, he replied, to howls of laughter from the men in the gallery. When Lee put questions to the Chief Marshal John O'Brien, he asked the judge, Your Worship, 
so you don't think I am here to answer these questions. Pointingly ref ref referencing the fact that a woman was in court asking. Once again, the court was filled with the rise real laughter. She read out a long statement as a conclusion. In 1912, by July 1912, Lee had not been long out of prison, having served two months for assaulting a police constable at a demonstration in January 1912. Her term in Mount Joy had actually been her ninth prison sentence. She's pictured here, exiting to crowds outside Winston Green Prison when she was released in 1909. There was much newspaper reaction to both the Prime Minister's visit and the attack on the Prime Minister. The Times said it is the subject of comment in political circles that it should be necessary for our public men to use extraordinary precautions to avoid assaults by militant suffragettes. The Daily Mail said things have come to a pretty pass when the Prime Minister has to dodge the passage to Dublin and when instead of bouquets, hatchets, have flung in his carriage. The Daily Telegraph said, Mr Asquith's engagements in the earlier part of the day were few, brief, and private, not to say secret. The Chief Secretary's lodge, hidden away in the greenery of the Phoenix Park, has been in what might almost be described as a state of siege, ever since the Premier entered its portals late last night. The gates are scrupulously barred practically to all but members of Mr. Birrell's party. Policemen and detectives swarm over the grounds, and all visitors are subjected to the closest scrutiny and interrogation. As he sat in the artistically plain but elegant drawing room of the lodge today, the Prime Minister simultaneously received a couple of deputations, one representing Ulster Liberals and the other the Liberalism of Dublin. I could not repress a feeling that the right honourable gentleman wore a distinctly anxious and careworn look. The Daily Telegraph Lee wrote in a warning to the powers in Dublin and London. She said, quote, Mr. Redmond's Irish stew that he compelled Mr. Asquith to eat is nothing compared to the hot pot that women will prepare if justice and votes for women are any longer delayed. Unquote. One of the Irish suffragette women who had been imprisoned in June 1912 following the attack on the GPO was Marjorie Hasler, who had been imprisoned in Tullamore. In March 1913, she died. The movement suggested that her ill treatment in prison exacerbated her death, which was as a result of measles. She was described as the, she was she was described upon leaving prison as appearing in a delicate condition when she was released. She was considered by the movement as the first martyr of the suffragette movement. So what is the aftermath of the attack on the British Prime Minister in Dublin in July 1912? But Prime Minister Henry Asquith, who had been elected Prime Minister in 1908, remained in his post on Downing Street until December 1916, two years into the First World War and just half of the Easter Rising. The Theatre Royal is no more, not to make way for an office block. It's business hit by cinemas and the emerging television industry. In the aftermath, it claimed for damages in October 1912. For the, for the damages caused by the suffragette attack, they claimed 18 pounds and seven shillings. They were awarded 17 pounds and 10 shillings. Mary Lee would eventually go back to England on December 20th, initially after being rearrested on board the SS Hibernia on December 18th, uh, having not got proper clearance from the authorities as she was breaking her license, having been released from her sentence of five years. In 1913, when Emily Davison was killed by the King's horse at Emsom, Lee was the chief mourner. The two had become intimate friends. Despite the standing down of the militant campaign following the outbreak of the First World War, Lee continued to battle for women's rights. In 1950, she was arrested when she unfurled a WSPU tricolour of green, white and purple at the funeral of George Bernard Shaw. The purple represented loyalty, white purity and green was for hope. Shaw was an advocate of the suffragette movement 
and even weighed in on the force feeding controversy by saying it was an, an abominable expedient. Mary Lee died in Stockport in 1978. Gladys Evans returned to the UK, but the force feeding took its toll and treatment for kidney damage was carried out in Bern, Switzerland, paid for by the suffragette movement. During the First World War, she worked as a volunteer ambulance driver. She moved to Canada and then to the United States in 1927, where she died in 1967. Now, in some autobiographies and biographies of uh, Evans, it says that she married a Hugh O'Connor, who was her lawyer. This is probably a reference to Hubert O'Connor, who was a suffragette supporter and a barrister and had defended Lee and Evans in a number of subsequent court cases in relation to their license when they were released. He was killed in action in the First World War in 1917 and there is no record of a marriage between Evans and O'Connor. Jenny Baines was married to George Baines and they had five children. In the aftermath of the suffragette movement and the First World War, they emigrated to Australia, where she continued to be involved in the suffragette movement down there. In total, Baines was imprisoned 15 times for her, for her beliefs and died in 1951. Mabel Capper, who had joined the WSPU in 1907, became a journalist writing for the Daily Herald, a supporter of women's rights. For the cause, she had been imprisoned six times and had been on hunger strike twice. She died in September 1966. In the 1918 general election, women were given limited voting rights over 30s and property owners. And famously, Countess Markovich became the first woman to be elected to the British House of Commons, even though she was still at the time in an English prison. Of course, she didn't take her seat there. Instead, she joined the new Dáil Éireann. And with the formation of the Irish Free State in 1922, women were granted universal suffrage. And Markovich, elected once more, became the first woman in the world to hold a cabinet position when she was made Minister for Labour. Deeds, not words, no surrender. A presentation of the 1916 Easter Rising Coach Tour.